stop looking at my tushy. Sony Pictures Animation was often overshadowed by Disney, Pixar, and DreamWorks, but with major success in some of its recent franchises, such as the Spider-Verse and Hotel Transylvania films, it's quickly become one of the major animation studios. And like all the others, many of these movies have plenty of jokes that go right over the kids' heads, with humor only the adults will understand. I'm Keefe Nosi with Wicked Binge, and today we're looking at Sony Animation's adult jokes, cleanest to dirtiest. And today we'll be starting with Sony's first computer animated film, Monster House, unethical heart to heart. He's got little presence in the movie, but DJ's father makes his mark by comforting his son after he's caught spying on his elderly neighbor, saying he did the same thing at his age. Thing, of course, it was with binoculars and involved the lovely Jensen twins. Not sure that's why DJ was looking at Nebercracker. God, I hope it wasn't. I don't blame you. If Bones' creepy refusal to back off his girlfriend isn't enough to make you hate him, the way he genuinely violates DJ's pet bunny with a non-consensual kiss should be enough. He also tears it apart viciously, which isn't an adult joke in itself, but we just wanted to highlight how much this dude sucks. Awesome kite or not. Chowder's mother's adultery. No, this isn't some deleted episode of Chowder that you missed. DJ's buddy Chowder tells him over the phone that his dad is away at the pharmacy and his mother's at the movies with her personal trainer. Guess it's tongue day, huh? Various references to drug use. This movie contains some references to alcohol too. For example, when Bones is kicked out by Z, he appears to be drunk and stumbling towards a titular monster house. And in a more on the nose example, Chowder asks DJ if he has any beer in one scene. Did DJ got any beer? Somebody please check on these kids because their folks clearly aren't. Not me. Chatter is the first one of the three kids to deduce that the monster house is possessed by a woman's spirit rather than a grouchy old man's. But for a strange reason, because it has a uvula, which we can only assume Chowder misheard as uterus or vulva, tis the season to move on to open season. From one grill to another. Shaw may be a nasty guy, but at least he's got some good quips. He threatens Elliot near the start of the movie by telling him, Looks like you're going from one grill to another. You do the math. What was that, buddy? Would it really be an adult jokes video without at least one almost F-bomb when Boog encourages the other animals to fight? I ain't going out without a fight. Buddy, the porcupine seems to have a different F-word come to mind. F-word? That's right. Hard to blame him. I mean, those hunters literally kill his kind for fun. More alcohol references. The police of Timberline aren't the worst you can find, but if the drunk arrests they perform, as well as the weirdly frequent drugged up animals are any indication, there needs to be a little more screening. No thanks, Elliot. Elliot's nice enough to offer Boog a fishy cracker from his pouch to lift his spirits. Want a fishy cracker? It would be nicer if the pouch in question weren't being carried around his pelvic region, but still, it's the thought that counts, to an extent. Wrong type of bear. The beavers find Boog being a bear to be pretty funny, thinking he's actually a hairy homosexual. Shame on you guys, it's 2023 now, and like the guys who are constantly chewing on wood have room to talk. You want to trade? Mini Mart Rampage. Boog and Elliot's wild party at the Mini Mart's probably the most memorable scene in the movie. Not only are the woohoo bars a pretty obvious metaphor for drugs and alcohol, but the two are just guys being dudes in every sense of the word. Side note, I'd like to just bring this similarity to your minds. If we saw it, you have to as well. Sit with us bros, surf's up is next. Pee and Gwen. Fun fact, did you know penguins can't pee? Apparently Geek didn't since he peed on Cody's foot to heal the pain from the sea urchin he stepped on. They make some water sounds. Oh my gosh, this is so gross. No, 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 no. You <sighs> Chicken Joe's dad. Looks like there aren't a lot of adult jokes in this movie. Just this little interview with Chicken Joe's father, Chicken Bob, a famous fried chicken restaurant mascot. Wait, oh. Oh, no, Chicken Joe, I'm so sorry. How about we change topics? Say, to open season two. Doe? A deer? A female deer? It's impressive that they held off on the inevitable Sound of Music reference until the second movie. It's the furthest thing from dirty, but still a nice nod for the grown-ups. What Fifi lost? Fifi is pretty much a house pet supremacist, which is already pretty dark for a kid's film, but tack on to that what he says about his first encounter with wild animals. I lost two things on that day, my innocence, and my squeaky toy. Be they human or animal, predators come in all shapes and sizes. Poor Fifi. The next spot's forecast, cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Movie references. There are a few references to classic films that viewers of pretty much all ages would probably catch. For example, Flint's method of destroying the gigantic meatball is similar to the way the Death Star is constructed and ultimately blown up in Star Wars. Also notable is Flint flying through a spaghetti tornado in a homage to The Wizard of Oz. The cherry on top. There's no shortage of food puns in this film. In fact, that's an understatement. It's working. But our 
personal favorite was this one scene where a gigantic stack of food manages to break a dam. The straw that broke the camel's back here was the cherry on top. No, literally, it, it was a single cherry. Swallow Falls. Yeah, this movie is pretty darn innocent overall, but we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention the fact that the setting is called Swallow Falls. Yeah, it's obviously one of the many food puns, but given how little food they have until Flint's invention, it's possible it was just a homage to how much the place sucks and swallows. With that, how about a getaway to the circus with open season three? Whatever happened to Pogs? Pogs are allegedly an old collectible from the 90s found in milk caps or shaped like milk caps. Help me out, Elliot. You've got plenty of them, right? Pogs. What happened to Pogs? Is it a dough problem? Elliot's far from the ideal father figure, but his sensitivity with his daughters is pretty touching. In one scene, he asks if they've got a dough problem and upon their confusion, immediately drops the subject. What's a dough problem? Nothing. What's up? Even the least competent dads have their moments. Oh dear. Say whatever you want about these sequels, but this movie ending with Ian the Deer, voiced by Patrick Wartburton, aka Joe Swanson and Kronk, popping out of a cake and acting as a male stripper is just, it's one of the movie moments we've ever seen, that's for sure. We aren't blue about our next movie, The Smurfs. Various pop culture references. There are some pretty clever pop culture references in The Smurfs' first adventure in the village of New York City. On top of the taxi they ride on in one scene, there's an advertisement for the Blue Man Group, which is just beautiful, honestly. There's also an homage to the famous lunch atop a skyscraper image later on, as well as a smurfier version of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in the credits. Smurfle and Monroeette. Maybe the most on the nose of these pop culture references is the scene where Smurfette walks in with a brand new dress that gets immediately blown upwards by an air vent in an homage to Marilyn Monroe. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> Kinda weird to just smurfualize her like that. Speaking of, watch your smurfanity. The Smurfs are known for using smurf as a substitute for other words. This can be as innocent as and as dirty as smurf me. Smurf of that what you will. Oh, shout out to I Kissed a Smurf and I Liked It. Not sure we want to see the music video for that one, though. Welcome to my world. Grouchy Smurf x Green M&M OTP. Even the most cynical of Smurfs, Grouchy can't resist the power of love when he falls into a bowl of M&Ms, but not as hard as he falls for the green M&M plush he's faced with. I don't like how he's looking at me. Dang, we really should have saved the whole tis the season line for Arthur Christmas, huh? Elf help. This one isn't dirty, but when an elf's fall causes collateral damage by changing a self-help sign to elf help, you just can't go without showing some appreciation. Kissing sailor, I mean elf. Regardless of your thoughts on the famous image of an American sailor returning to his homeland and promptly kissing the first woman he sees, this homage to it in Arthur Christmas was apparently something nobody even thought twice about. Grand Santa's plan, de Santa. What did make everyone think twice was Grand Santa's method of keeping children from remembering if they'd seen Santa. A whack on the head with a sock full of sand and a dab of whiskey on the lips they don't remember in the morning. I mean, he'll forget till he enters the therapist's office later in life, at least. Avast, you landlubbers. Next be the pirate's band of misfits. Mr. Bobo's swear. Mr. Bobo is a fancy monkey butler who communicates through cue cards, but he's not always all that elegant. When Pirate Captain pitches his plan for getting Polly back from Queen Victoria to him and Charles Darwin, Mr. Bobo leaves a trail of cards that leave a strong but clear message. Bonus points for the elephant trumpet once Pirate Captain gets to the censored card. Why do you think they all got that tattoo? When Pirate Captain needs a little pick-me-up, the pirate with a scarf reminds him of how much he inspires the crew. They even got matching tattoos of him, one of them on his butt. Right, no weird implications there. The captain's promise. But when the captain fails his crew by giving away Polly in exchange for treasure from Queen Victoria, he promises them a trip to a tropical island where the ladies' tops don't leave much to the imagination. Well, now, hold on guys, everyone deserves a second chance. But we'll have an adventure somewhere tropical with those native ladies whose outfits don't leave much to the imagination. Charles's interesting habit. No doubt Charles would have taken him up on it. When the two are in a hot air balloon, he comments, It's true! We aren't condoning this behavior, but we're genuinely curious how he could do so from that high up. Who's up for an undead dance party? Let's stay a night at Hotel Transylvania. What you looking at, kid? In one of Dracula's cautionary anti-human presentations, he shows a picture of a little kid eating ice cream while looking at an adult's butt. Oh, to be innocent enough to not realize how creepy that is. Speaking of creepy, how did Drac get that picture? A bone to pick. In another scene, Drac and Johnny accidentally walk in on a skeleton woman taking a shower. They're reasonably yelled at by the lady's husband, who is also naked, I, I think. How does that work for skeletons? Anatomical gags. That's just one of many, many weird anatomy gags in this movie, from an invisible man unreasonably freaking out over being pantsed to Frankenstein's ability to separate any of his body parts at any time. There's a lot in this movie that's better to not think about all that much. Everyone stop the roughhousing! Parenting. And while not exactly inappropriate, Dracula's helicopter parenting makes for an interesting story that shows a lot of the toxic sides of being an overprotective 
abusive parent. Seriously, the relationship between him and Mavis runs surprisingly deep. Really makes you think about where both of them are coming from. It's honestly impressive coming from the same movie with haha -ha, funny mummy fart joke. I was not the cause of that. Now if that last one blew you away, just wait for the Smurfs too. The puns are smurfing my will to smurf. Among the best, aka the worst, are Smurf Book, Facebook, Smurf Home Syndrome, Stockholm Syndrome, Blue Velvet Cake, Red Velvet. Is that a birthday cake? And my personal favorite, Patrick calls his father Martin Luther Wing when he sets some ducks free from a kitchen. What are you, Martin Luther Wing? But now it's time for the kiddos to really leave the room because we've got a lightning round sausage party. This movie is special in that it's very far from child friendly, just in general. It's also special special in that it's one of the most horrific things we've ever witnessed. It's like a car crash and we're taking you to the crime scene with us. Because this movie was never meant for kids, we'll just do some highlights which get progressively, progressively worse. Holy he can actually see us? Teresa the taco saying mother effer in Spanish repeatedly. Firewater talking about getting drugged up enough to bang another guy. A used condom discussing the trauma of its life experience. Look at me. Look at me. A reference to Attack on Titan of all things during the movie's climax. The German sauerkraut wanting to exterminate the juice. Not to mention every food leaning into their cultural stereotypes. Countless sexual innuendos. It would be impossible to list all of them. And last but not least, the final scene, a literal food orgy. We can relate to that condom from earlier a little more now because, like it, we are going to have a very difficult time on seeing the horrors we just witnessed. This was a line. This was a line nobody should have crossed. This is taking the gold medal of what the unholy hell did I just watch? I guarantee this movie was spawned from Seth Rogen and his friends sitting around smoking weed and landing on the idea of, Hey guy, <laughs> what if food smoked weed too? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I really need a shower, but I'll accept a storm at this point. Enter Cloudy with a chance of meatballs too. That was the cheese. Okay, let's cleanse our brains of that absolute nightmare with some more wholesome food stuff. Some innocent food puns, courtesy of Earl and company, like when he literally cuts the cheese to make a sound we're all familiar with by now. Uh, that was the cheese. Jurassic Park homage. On first entering the island, the camera pans out on the new, unfamiliar landscape with some beautiful music and an homage to the iconic scene from Jurassic Park. The BSUSB. Acting as the main MacGuffin of the movie, the BSUSB could probably unintentionally be interpreted as the bullshit USB. In one scene, Barry poops it out of his little body from sheer terror. Not sure how that works anatomically, but okay. Dance Dance Bevolution. In the final battle with Chester, Barry enters a mech suit from an interesting hole and uses his DDR skills to get it up and running. We were debating whether or not to mention this one, but bro, why did he enter from there? I suggest you drop your cans. How to make a gorilla stew. In one scene, Brent asks Manny how to make a gorilla stew, referring to food. Manny's response is simple. You keep it waiting for two hours. A reference to how one's wife might be angry if kept waiting for that long. Hard to blame that gorilla, really, you could at least shoot them a text. Chester will hire anyone, huh? When Steve and Flint first arrive at Chester V's lab, Steve sips some coffee that he promptly describes as hot. Hot. A passing scientist lady tells him, Not too bad yourself, monkey. I'd like to apologize to Grouchy Smurf for earlier because as much as I don't like how he's looking at me, I really don't like how she's looking at a literal monkey. Hope you've gotten a membership with the Drax Hotel because we're back with Hotel Transylvania too. Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera helps narrate the final act of the movie to which he's promptly shut up for interrupting the dramatic tension. Sorry man, gotta read the room better. Shut up! Frank, you're a genius. Apparently Frank is into cosplaying Dracula, which leads to an awkward encounter between the two where the former is shirtless. I love how Drac just <laughs> immediately drops it and doesn't question it further. Frank, you're a genius. Child endangerment. In one of his many tests of whether or not Denisovich, I mean, Dennis is a vampire, Drac straight up drops him off of a tall tower to see if he can fly. This is a tall tower. That's why it's good. I mean, yeah, he, he saves him, but how is this man not in jail? One up binge fans rejoice. Next up is Adam Sandler star Pixels. Electric Dreams Factory. The name of the arcade at the start of the movie is The Electric Dreams Factory, a homage to the movie Electric Dreams, which most of this film's target audience are likely familiar with. Not E for everyone. Since this movie is PG-13, it has a few more instances of dirty language and jokes than others on this list, but there are still some scenes worth mentioning. Adam Sandler tells a woman to grab onto his mighty hammer to pull her up when she's about to fall, which she comments, You love saying that. Yes, I do. Honorable mentions to our boy Cuber, 
Ebert, who both curses and pisses over the course of this film. Just fantastic stuff. Viewer beware, this next entry is not for the faint of heart. It's Goosebumps, the principal's speech. In the school assembly, the principal's excitedly talking about her upcoming dance, saying, We can't stop twerking about it. This is a clear reference to how out of touch teachers can be with students. Oh, but if you thought that movie was scary, that's nothing compared to open season. Scared silly. <laughs> oh, sorry. I scared myself. Elliot's encouragement. See what you will about Elliot, but his encouraging phrase is one we'll remember for years to come. Did the Titanic call it quits when it hit the ice cream truck? No, sir, it did not. I don't think. Wait. No, yeah, it did. Wait, I'm lost. Code Brown. In one scene, Elliot inadvertently eats McSquizzy's poop. He's good. What? What else do we say here? What can we possibly add? They're so blatant about it, too. The scene goes on for like two minutes. Let's fling ourselves right into the next entry, the Angry Birds movie. Looking at all their business here. Red tells his newfound friends that he's looking at the pig's business, to which Chuck responds that he really admires it. That part about them I really admire. To his credit, they do know how to shake it. Don't worry about your balloon. They don't know how to protect the environment, though. When a little bird loses its balloon, a pig consoles him by saying, It'll just land in the ocean. <laughs> The fish love it! Until it pollutes their ecosystem and ultimately kills them, that is. Red's thing. When Red tells Chuck he doesn't want to hang out because he's got a thing, the latter thinks he might mean a disease. One of the ones he mentions is a cardinal sin, which is probably a bird pun, and since the term cardinal sin can refer to any of the seven deadly sins, it's anyone's guess as to what Chuck had in his head. How did I forget? Even if you'd said yes, I probably couldn't have gone. The horrors of Terence. Speaking of horrors, in the bird's anger management class, Terence is the biggest mystery of the bunch. The group leader takes one look at his file, filling her with horror and him with the memories of sirens, destruction, and screaming women. He looks neither remorseful nor fond. Who hurt you, Terence? Don't spit in his mouth. To the horror of Red and the audience, Chuck and Bomb enjoy spitting water into each other's mouths during a swim. Yep, I got nothing else to add there. No, don't spit it back! Angry flockin' birds. When he's rallying the other birds to fight the pigs, Red tells them he needs some angry flockin' birds. Now who's angry? Which is very close to angry f***ing birds. Speaking of dirty-minded lines, honorable mention to Red saying, Drop your nuts and move your butts! The weirdly high amount of male stripper references. Both the Mighty Eagle and some dancing pigs perform strip-teasing dances at various points throughout the movie. Wow. Someone on the animation team must have either had a big paycheck or just some really weird interests. Reference to The Shining. Red accidentally walks in on two pigs who immediately say, Red rum. A reference to the classic horror film The Shining. Good choice leaving there, Red. Mighty Eagles bird watching. And let's not forget the Mighty Eagles hobby of bird watching, which mostly consists of him ogling female birds relaxing in hot tubs. Perhaps most unsettling is that when Red calls him disgusting, Mighty Eagle seems to be genuinely proud of that label. Oh yeah. Next up it wait, there was a Surf's Up sequel? Apparently yeah, Surf's Up 2, Wave Mania. Fish milk. Aside from being possibly the most unnecessary sequel of all time, Surf's Up 2 is pretty clean, unless you count the references WWE fans might get to their favorite wrestlers. That said, Mr. McMahon's desire to drink milk from a fish is on another level of messed up. The fact that he envisions himself drinking it from a straw straight from said fish's crotch just makes it even worse. Uh, all right, then I'll drink your coconut water. You better believe I'm gonna pretend I'm sucking it from a fish's udder. Next, let's go beyond Smurf Village and NYC in Smurfs The Lost Village. Don't be weird, Papa. This movie's also pretty squeaky clean for the most part, except one scene where Papa, ready to enact his escape plan, says, It's time to rock the cage. Pertaining to the cage they're in, Lily Smurf promptly tells him, Don't be weird. Implying she thought something else would be making the cage rock. Everyone give a warm, smiley face welcome to the Emoji Movie! Eyes up here. Gene asks a clock emoji for the time, but apparently he was looking somewhere less than ethical, since the clock promptly tells him, Hey, my eyes are up here, pal. Gene's question. In one scene, Gene candidly asks High Five, What could a teenage boy possibly want to hide from his parents? Given the privacy app having a skin over it, High Five reasonably gives him a confused glare. Okay, maybe this movie wasn't all bad. It was close, though. It's about time we just get away from it all. How about to Hotel Transylvania 3, Summer Vacation? Wayne and Wanda's exhaustion. It can't be easy parenting like 50 kids, so when Wayne and Wanda find a daycare service to take them off their hands, their only complaint is when they find out it's not permanent. Don't worry, you get them back at the end of the day. Kinda dark, but come on, we have to be understanding now. Drax time on Zinger. Drax's singlehood has finally made him resort to dating apps. Sorry to see it, buddy. He's also fallen so far that he can't help but babble
babble incoherently upon first talking to Erica. The Chupacabra's order. A Chupacabra is brought his drink order, a goat in a glass. The second it's off screen, we can hear it absolutely screeching. Given that Chupacabra literally means goat sucker, there are two ways to interpret this, and we're not sure which one is scarier. All right, now for one of the best movies of the entire studio, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Bitcoin, new highs, new lows. Peter B. Parker sees his own death reported on the news, as well as a ticker reading, Bitcoin hits new high, then Bitcoin hits new low. Looks like the only thing that coin bit is the dust. No other reason. When Spider-Ham meets Miles for the first time, he offers a handshake. A very wet, slimy handshake. It's okay, he just washed his hands, so that's why they're wet. Put that thing away, there are like children here! Hopefully sequels don't make you guys mad, because next is the Angry Birds movie too. Necessary censorship. By reading Zoe's lips in one scene, a blaring foghorn isn't enough to distract from the fact that this woman just blatantly dropped the F-bomb in a kid's movie. Leonard's outfit, but that's as dirty as the sequel gets, unless you count Leonard's g-string outfit. Your wish is our command. Next is the wish dragon. Long knows how to party. While in his human servant form, Long shows his wild side at Lena's birthday party. Okay, party time. He ends up accidentally slapping a woman's butt, who seems to be really into it, and ends up chasing him to the point where he has to hide in the bathroom and accidentally drinks from a bidet to sober up. Get a room, dragons. In another scene, when the heroes and bad guys are fighting while dressed as parade dragons, it looks like the dragons are making out and also vomiting. Getting some mixed signals here, but there's one signal that's very clear. You guys need to get a room. How do you like them apples, huh? Rip Clucky. Now let's have a moment of tearful silence for Lena and Din's pet chicken, Clucky. He died for our sustenance. Well, their sustenance. At least the drumsticks we're pretty good, it seems. All right, one last trip to Hotel Transylvania. Transformania, check it out. In a dance number, one monster says, check it out, right before the camera pans to the fully nude crotch of a skeleton. I thought these were family movies. Johnny, your tail. While falling to their almost death, Johnny ends up repeatedly slapping Drax's butt with his tail, going for the father-in-law. Okay, interesting twist. What does he think I said? As if revealing he's been perpetually naked the entire time, the Invisible Man also makes a toast to Blobby, as he should. But in his Blobby language, he ends up saying something offensive, as he shouldn't. I just said, here's a toast to a bunch of great guys. Very fine ass. And despite their best efforts, the Werewolf Pups' happy anniversary sign gets jumbled up to instead spell, very fine ass. Man, what's with this movie in putts? Our final entry for the day is the newest Sony animation movie, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Doctor Strange. Gwen's comment that someone called Dr. Strange should not be practicing medicine is not only funny, it's also completely reasonable. Okay. Spider-Man pointing meme. Come on, it's a movie with multiple Spider-Man variations. Of course, they had to reference an iconic meme like this. Miles Morales, exposed. In another scene, Miles slides down a fire escape and prepares to change clothes into his Spider-Man suit. A passerby is recording him, prompting Miles to slowly re-zip his pants. Ignoring the obvious joke, that passerby is a creep, man. Apology video. In the opening scene of the movie, Miles recaps what he's been up to since we last saw him. Him, one of which includes him making a clear parody of those infamous YouTuber apology videos. At least he doesn't have a ukulele or a place on the sex offender registry. Stop talking about your holes. For our grand finale, we have a worker's very reasonable request for the spot to stop talking about his holes as he's making everyone uncomfortable. Unfortunately, he's got a whole lot more coming. 